everybody, Chris Yonker here, and I am here today with um, Tom Shields. And Tom, I am not going to read your bio. I'm just going to introduce you no, uh, the way I know you. So um, if that's okay. Um, I met Tom from, man, I don't know, Tom. I'm going to say, what's 15, 16 years plus-ish or so. And what ended up happening was I was re listening to some audios from Nightingale Conant. And in there was this back of this audio program was this Brian Tracy, who I love Brian Tracy. Um, he had like this coaching program. I'm like, wow, that sounds kind of cool. So I reached out to my manager and I said, hey, can I, I'm going to look into this and what could I think of something I could do if I could better myself. And he said, oh, I'm like, well, check it out. So I reached out to Nigel Conant, introduced this guy, Don Swanson, I think it was the guy's name. I don't know, his name just rings, hits my head. And uh, Don and I had this conversation, and then he said, yeah, we have a 12-week coaching program, yada, 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 around X, Y, and Z. And these coaches are all working directly with Ryan Tracy and blah, blah, blah. And um, I've got this guy who's really good, and he's an amazing listener. He's very, in, you know, he's got this great intensity about him, and I think you should coach with him. And I said, sounds good. Tom uh, started coaching me, and he started he, he started opening me. More people are coming in here. He started opening up my eyes. And one thing that I got from Tom when I started working with Tom is that um, he helped me see things that I couldn't see, and that was really interesting because you you hear it's pretty part potentially part of his um, story, and um, he was really good at helping me create a new clarity. And not only what I could want, what I wanted, but also what was possible. So my vision, my vision standpoint, I was able to see things better beyond myself in regards to what I wanted to create and also live in a high level uh, alignment with my values. But in addition to that, um, he helped me see more about me and what my own, like who I am and what I'm capable of. And then he worked with me through, to write, basically recreate new stories and associations. And actually, Tom was also the one who encouraged me to get into coaching. And he's also the one who encouraged me to start studying NLP. And then that led to my relationship with Wyatt Woodsmall. So anyway, Tom is an extremely instrumental, um, been a real close friend, um, someone that like if something happens in my life that's not really good, he's one of the first people I still reach out to to this day. He's like on that list, short list, and because uh, he, he just, he's got some great, great counsel and as steady as a rock. You don't ever, ever to quite, you know, whatever's going on, this guy's uh, usually pretty, pretty steady. Um, so um, that, and Tom's been doing what he's been doing for, as a coach uh, for well over 20 years. Um, he's got a, a great experience. And uh, so Tom, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you, Tom, for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for having me and, and being sharing this time with you and all of our uh, our viewers and our guests here today. Yeah. So Tom, why don't why don't you share a little bit about um, your story and then we're gonna we're gonna go into well let me actually before we do that, let me talk about why we're here. I think that'd be a great place to start and then we can talk we'll, we'll insert that. So I think it's always good to talk about why am I here and what do I want from this the, this time we have together. And I think we're, we're in a situation right now in history, which everyone realizes like this is an extremely um, important time for all of us. And um, the best adage that I've heard is this adage of around, well, we're, we're not all really in this together. Um, we're all um, in the same storm, but we're not really necessarily in it together. Some boats have been shipwrecked. Some boats, um, they've got water on board. There's, everyone's in a different state in regards to the impact um, this crisis has brought on to folks. And it can be on a personal front, professional front, regardless, it's been different for everybody. And so we, have to, we always have to kind of hold that as a reality and, and just understand that no matter what, and there's life's that way too, that each of us is experiencing the situation a little differently. But what I do know is that our normal way of life, whatever we have defined as normal, these finger quotes here, over, you know, up till the last six, eight weeks has changed for everybody in, in most of the world, quite frankly, because folks have had to change how they live and how they operate for a time being. And though it's caused a pause, I don't believe, I don't like that word very much because I don't think that just like you hit the pause button and then you release it and like my, my daughter would on a video and it just goes back to where it was before <laughs> and it just boots back in. Uh, I, I think that 
um, it's in many cases, it's it more, much more even a reset. And it's got a lot of positive tendencies. And part of the reason I wanted to, uh, to invite Tom in today is because I, I believe this is an amazing time for all of us. While our normal world has been disrupted to stop, check in and say, you know what? What am I gonna take from this experience? And how am I gonna do, use this to recreate and, and rewrite however I want the rest of my story to look? And um, this, is a, uh, this is an amazing time in history to do that. And so I thought no one better really than Todd to bring into a conversation like that from my experience to have that type of dialogue. So that's, that's our goal. Um, we'll, we're going we're gonna to banter uh, here for uh, a little bit, and then we'll, we'll open it up. We'll stop the recording, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, Tom, why don't you give me a mind sharing maybe some of your, your, your story, because I think it's extremely relevant, a few different things, in relationship to how you chose to refocus your own life and what, 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 what that was like. Yeah, and that's the right word, refocus um, on many levels. Um, so I grew up with a visual impairment. Uh, I was extremely nearsighted. And it was, you know, pretty challenging, um, especially like in school, not being able to see the board. Um, of course, you don't want to bring any attention to yourself, but, you know, kids can be pretty tough. Um, but, you know, I dealt with it the best I could. Um, but it also, at you know, as I got older and more into early adulthood, it was became challenged like, hey, really can't drive at night, things like that. So I ended up, um, at one point, I actually was seen by 29 eye doctors all at, in one setting. And basically the, their view was, well, we not really much we can do. But inside it was like, no, there's gotta be a way. There's gotta be something that can be done. So um, I was working at the New York State Department of Transportation at the time. And someone told me, oh, you need to go talk to this guy in the next building, this guy named Bernie. And I talked to him and he said, well, um, you really need to go see this eye doctor in Boston. And his name was Dr. Scapins. And I don't know, I'm sure you've all been in, or some of you have been into Boston, but um, it's called the uh, Retina Associates. There's the Eye Research Institute, which is also affiliated with Harvard. And this guy was absolutely amazing. Um, people came from all over the world to see him. So immediately they started trying different things, um, like dilating my eyes and keeping them dilated all the time. And I've never had your eyes dilated. You're out in the sun. It can be really tough. Imagine doing that all the time. But at least it gave me a glimpse of seeing around the lenses in my eyes. So I was like, hmm, here's what might be possible. So um, December 1989, I went in for a checkup for um, routine check up with a cardiologist and he called me back the next day and said, um, we have a problem. Um, and, you know, I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, we'll recheck in a week, which they did. And he at the time said, well, you're a walking time bomb. And I had a aortic aneurysm at that time of 6.5 centimeters. Um, and ended up going to Johns Hopkins for open heart surgery on Valentine's Day, 1990. Um, as when I first spoke to them, they said, well, we'll have a coming out party. Their humor. <laughs> so anyhow, um, and right around that time, my left eye really deteriorated. So it was like, I could barely see out of it. Uh, I think part of that was probably due to stress. Um, anyhow, I had the successful open heart surgery, but. October that year, I had the first eye surgery on my left eye. And this actually happened during both eye surgeries, but I became aware and conscious of actually what was going on during the surgery. And instead of freaking out, 
I described it as more of like a spiritual experience of like, okay, if they're working on my eye, then who's watching what they're doing? And to me, it was like, okay, who's this silent witness in here that's experiencing this experience? And the reality is that every one of you are doing that every day, just as you're doing right now. You're experiencing this experience. There's a you know, silent witness or you know, self or whatever you want to call it that's experiencing this. And so I had the second eye surgery and, and that was even the technique had improved significantly. So my eyes came together and I went from being nearsighted, like a negative 13.5 prescription to plus six and becoming farsighted but being able to see 2020 for the first time in my life at like age 33. And, you know, still to this day, you know, it's like just being out in the car and looking ahead and wow, I can see like three or four street, you know, red lights ahead or whatever. Um, still amazing to me, but going through those experiences, it was like, I, I knew there was a real shift and at one point I went to actually went to like a therapist, a couple of them. And they're like, oh, well, you know, you went through this and that's understandable. I'm like, no, something's different. And I asked the question, how can I help other people to experience what I'm experiencing without necessarily having to go through what I went through? And that set me on a path of, uh, you know, somebody said, oh, you might want to read this book. And that's, uh, that's how I learned about NLP. And I said, oh, I need to do that. And one thing led to another. And I'm like, during the nineties, I was just like, a, like this learning machine. I couldn't, you know, I was working on a master's degree, doing NLP training, all kinds of other training. Just, I wanted to know what I experienced. How could I take that and really uh, train myself and, and then teach that to others. And eventually I came up with, the name optimal vision and you know that's what i look at what i do is help people refocus their life and realize their optimal vision and just like my case where i eventually was able to see 2020 i did that in a very unique way and i think that's the case for every every person your vision is can be is, is completely different from someone else's but the more we get aligned with who we are um, I think that's really possible. The interesting thing for me was though, even though I could then see 2020, all those years of that conditioning of, well, you can't do this or you can't see, or you can't, I realized that they had actually gone and removed the lenses from my eyes. So I don't have lenses, but I said, well, they didn't go in and remove the limiting beliefs that I still held on to. So I had to find a way to extract the limiting beliefs that I was still holding on to that were keeping me from realizing my vision. And in simplest terms, I just said, I just really want to help people to see. And at one point I thought about being a teacher of the visually impaired and it was applying for a graduate program for that University of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> and they required that you go spend time with people that actually did that. And when I you know, took time to do that, and I kind of went, wow, you know, God bless them for what they're doing but it's not quite it. This isn't for me. It's not, there's something more, but it still has to do with vision. You know, so like when Chris said, oh, I really helped him to see things. Somebody described me that way yesterday. And it's like, um, you know, I did this other thing, strengths finders and it's like the top five and every other word was, you have a unique ability to see or help others to see. And the most powerful question that I asked, and we'll probably get into this a little bit, Chris, is when I said, well, what if everything that I've been through in my life was actually training and preparing me for what I'm supposed to be doing now and going forward? Yeah, so I, said, I think that's a good question. And I, I, think I would challenge folks listening. And just maybe one of the things I think would like, Tom and I like to do today is present you with questions. Yep. You can write down. And I mean, answer right now, but walk away with, right? And that would be a good one to start with. Yeah. Can you say it one more time, Tom? 
what if everything that you've been through in your life, everything you've experienced, whether it's personal, uh, educational, work, everything, what if that is actually training and preparing you for what you're really supposed to be doing or want to be doing in your life? Right. And it may be, well, you know, it may not mean that you have to change what you're doing, but taking it to a whole different level, making better use of the gifts and talents and knowledge and skills that you've gained to a whole new level with what you're already doing. Right. And it doesn't mean I have to change necessarily what I do, but that was one of the things that um, Tom helped me do uh, at 3M was just that uh, he helped me realize that one of my strengths was around this, had this maximizer theme of up leveling things. And then so he helped, I started changing my focus a little bit of like, well, where, where, where are things that I can up level and impact? And it became, it became more fun because I became more engaged to what I was doing. It didn't, it wasn't any longer just a sales job anymore. It was how do I maximize this, you know, what we do and how we do it. And it became, it became more of a, a mission and uh, improved my level of purpose tied to what I do, and which is important, right? I think a lot of us live out of either misalignment of values and or misalignment out of what our purpose is tied to what we're doing. Can you talk about, Tom, like, like, if, like if we're going to look into like this, this conversation around life inventory, all right, let's, let's challenge folks that are listening. I'm going to take inventory because it's going to stop and take this weekend, next week. I'm just going to take inventory on where I'm at on my life journey and where are the opportunities for me to refocus, realign, whatever it is that I want to do, up level certain parts of my life, if any, and where would I want to activate change around a mindset or a strategy or something I want to do? What would, how, would you, how would you suggest to someone to check in on values and why is that important? Um. Well, it's kind of interesting that, you know, some people are saying, well, you know, that because we're, they like to say, we're, you know, we're stuck at home or safe at home, however you want to view that. Um, some people are saying, well, I'm, I'm starting to clean my house now. You know, went through a closet and it's like, well, it's just like cleaning your house, but now we're going to look at the rooms of your life. And I tend to look at like, you know, I call it the 10 rooms of your life or 10 departments. And you know, as people are going through like a closet in their house or whatever, and they're going, hey, yeah, I don't, why am I still hanging on to that? So it becomes, you know, I think all what's going on is, is, is helping us to kind of refocus and look at what we really value. You know, um, people are, some people, um, and I want to say they, you know, maybe not necessarily purposely, but I've, you know, coached people in the past where it's like, oh, you know, I, I, um, you know, I lost my job or whatever. And I said, well, what was your thinking right before that happened or leading up to that? I really need a break. And it's like, well, you got your cooperation, you know, but now what are you going to do at that time? So, you know, reassessing, what is it that you really value? And, you know, sometimes we say, you know, be true to your values, but sometimes I think people just, it's probably more of realigning their values. Obviously health and fitness and wellness is, you know, on people's mind these days. Yeah. Have we been, have, have they been making that a priority? Maybe not. It's not, you know, this isn't a judgment or, Anything like that, it's just, yeah, I need to shift, you know, I want to shift things around a bit. I want to make that more important. Time with family. Yeah. Okay. Now I got that. Yeah. That's important. Maybe spirituality, you know, I need to tune into that more. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think one thing that uh, my, my philosophy is, is that, you know, life is, is, is what I, call, I call it short. It's all in perspective, but it's, it's, it's a definitive period of time. We don't know when it's going to end, but to what degree do we want to be happy, have joy, have peace and be fulfilled, right? And contribute. Like these are core, core tenants that I, I work off of. 
and the folks that typically hire us, this is what these are things, their philosophy also. And in order to drive these outcomes of being happy, having peace, being fulfilled, I mean, it's to more times than not, it's accessible. But the challenges that we run into is we, we don't see how or what. But first, we've got to get clear on, like, is this something that I want to have? And where am I, you know, where am I not fulfilled and or happy? And I, when you see it brought up the, the, the value idea of, like, I could say I value my family. Families would maybe a department or room in my house. Well, um, right now, like more, more families are spending more time together um, than they have in a very long time. And it, I wonder if people are looking at that and like, well, what part of that do they want to keep going forward? Right? Do they want to go back to the place of like, hey, we're, we just see each other a couple dinners a week and we're in and out and then we come together at points in time? Or do we say, hey, you know, we're having deals together every night now, which we didn't do before, or maybe that was, that's a change for somebody. Um, but that, that would be aligning somewhere with the, with, with the values. And it's, um, I remember Wyatt saying to me uh, some time ago, we, he said, um, you know, we say we, we value certain things. Um, he said, if you want to check in with a, a client on whether in a coaching pers perspective, of, if someone's aligned with their values, have them take out their calendar for the last 90 days and their checkbook for the last 90 days. And then, and then have them show where they're spending their time and money in relationship to what they say they value and look for things that are congruent and incongruent. And he said, you'll be surprised because for a lot of folks, or they'll be surprised that they say we value something, but then are we really truly, right? Like, you know, I value learning and I've invested a lot of money in learning and development. It's one of learners, one of my, one of my attributes that's come up even on the strengths finder, right? So I, that, that is a way to just to see its, its existence. But I think as we do a check-in, on you know where where what do I say I value? How am I investing my time and energy in those departments? Is is probably a good a, a good way to, to tune into that. Um, what would you say about fulfillment in life and and how you know what what what's been your experience in regards to where fulfillment comes from? How would you how would you how would you answer that? Hmm. Um, I think it's more for, I would describe it more as things that really bring you joy. You know, I, often we hear people pursuing things, you know, I want this, then I'll be happy. And to me, happy is more of a temporary thing. Oh, okay. Then we, we accomplish that. We get that. Um, and that, that wears off quickly. When something brings you really joy, real, you know, real joy, I think that comes more from within, comes from God, comes through you. Yeah. And, you know, it was like yesterday, it was like nonstop coaching or calls or uh, this other group that I'm part of, we were doing, and it was like, bang, 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 all day long. At the end of the day, I was just like, wow, that was awesome. You know, it just felt like it was in a zone because I'm doing something that's very fulfilling. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like how I describe what I had been through in my life. And then I took that and like, wow, how can I use this? It's you know, became more like a calling to help others. And I think that's a big piece of it as well. It's not just about you. It's like, how is what you're doing really making a difference? Yeah. That becomes more fulfilling. Right. Yeah, I, that's, I think that's a good point um, that you brought up in relationship to be a, a, another question to ask is, where do I fulfill, feel, feel fulfilled? Where do I not feel fulfilled? But also, what sucks my energy is another really interesting question to ask. Because then you heard you say, I got to the end of the day, I felt awesome. Well, that tells me that either you're energy neutral or energy positive on an experience, right? It didn't take, it didn't suck you. Well, some no, things no. we do, we do, they, they do, they drain the living crap out of us. And then we're like, holy shit, I can't, whew, like, I don't have more to give. And if someone asked me like, hey, go ahead and do analytics on this spreadsheet. I, like last night, I was trying to figure something out. And I was trying to look at this, the 6,000 lines of data. And I had this other thing and I'm like, I knew with VLOOKUP would work. And so I got onto um, YouTube and I'm like, why am I doing this? 
why? So I asked someone else to do it and they had it done this morning first thing because they love doing stuff like that. And, you know, and I don't, and I know I don't. And I was asking myself, what are you doing? <laughs> don't do stuff that you don't enjoy doing. There's always someone who does enjoy doing it. That's what teams are about. Um, and that there, there are times when we have to, and like, this is another question I wanted to ask. And this is a really interesting one, I think, because if I've had a challenge or a struggle with this one over the years. And because I created a story around it and there's this word called sacrifice and there's a lot of ways to unpack this word and or uh, associations we can create around sacrifice. But I think a lot of people don't obtain what they truly desire or want with their life because there's something they're not willing to sacrifice because they've created a story around whatever the sacrifice is. What's your, what's your thought to that or response to that? And what have, what have you witnessed with folks that are showing up that way? And that are like, you know, like they're in a massive either or scenario and they're not willing to sacrifice what it's gonna take to get what they want because they define that for themselves. Does that make sense, the question? Yeah. So, um, so are, are you say you struggle with that word? Is it that you don't buy into that word or what's. I yeah. Mean? Well, that's a good question. So part of my challenge was for years is that I'm like, well, I'm not willing to do this. Like, so when I started my coaching, I, I'm working with 3M. So like, okay, I got two things going on and I'm like, well, I'm not willing to do both because I'm not going to have any time for my family. You with me on that? Yeah. That's, an, that's an either or paradigm. But I've already made a decision on the entry point that it has to be that way. Right. You with me on that? Uh -huh. And a lot of us do this. Like you hear other you know, folks that are other coaches, they'll say, you got to be doing, willing to do whatever it takes. Right? Do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what the hell is that supposed to mean, right? Like, so if I got to punch someone in the face, then that's what I need to do. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and sometimes I want to like, well, I'm not willing to, to, to one of the things that I you know I've, I've worked with you on over the years when I was, especially when I was getting going, is like, I don't really have to go against my own values. And one of the values that I have was like, I don't want to, you know, I'm a recovered workaholic. I don't want to go back there. Like, I'm not interested in being a workaholic. I have those tendencies and I'm a recovered one. But I had, to, I had to like, well, how do I get to have more? Like, there's a paradigm of, I, in order to have more, I have to give more. I have to do more. I have to work harder. I have to work longer. This is a very common paradigm in our society. Do you agree? Absolutely. And I, you know, I recall from, I have a pretty good memory of um, some of those experiences with you way back when. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of that was you had people telling you that as well. That's right. Okay. That's right. And, you know, you have to, and it's like, well, what if balance is important to you? What if you value balance? Yeah, I do. Well, then live true to yourself, not what other people think that you should be doing. You know, and it's like, well, you know, what they said this or, you know, and it's, I always used to say to you, um, stay true to your values, which a lot of times can go against what maybe other people are telling you. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, people compromise that. And that's why they don't feel good. They don't feel fulfilled because they're going against what they know is more in alignment with who they are. Yeah. And that goes back, you know, I think that there's a, there's another element to like what's really our truth and what we really want. Because when you can desire something, there's a, there's, there can be a, an attachment to something that serves our ego. That's one element. But then on the other side of it, there's could just be like, I like this. I like, you know, for example, Jolie and I like nice experiences or we like quality. Doesn't mean I'm a brand whore. It just means that I like things that are, are, are at a certain level because of how, they, how I feel about them. And 
and there's there you know and and, and that that's just aligned with now something I, I worked on with you years years ago I remember is like a part of me was feeling like well you know am I pursuing something because I want to stay at this uh, uh this type of hotel or whatever and you're like well quality is an is is part of of your values so you want to live in correlation to it so there's no judgment about that and it really helped me create some 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 peace in that in that in that conversation but i think it's a lot of times we get when we get a lot trying to figure out what's really in my truth and then what society like you said i was getting influenced we get influenced from society friends family people around us in general about how we think things should or shouldn't be how our life should or shouldn't be and then we start making decisions from that without really knowing that it's not necessarily reality yeah and it's kind of like back to the thing you know like you're saying about like sacrifice and i've heard people you know like just wait with the word balance and they'll say well that doesn't exist you yeah know, balance doesn't doesn't like really balance. exist yeah. and i always go well you sure know when you're out of balance don't you and to me it's not so much of balance as it's more about an integration and when you start to really take that inventory of what you really value and it's how does that you know it becomes more of your personal vision of what does this look like the way that i I'd, I'd like to live yeah you know and, and stop trying to keep up with the joneses right right you know let yeah. the joneses be the joneses you be yeah. whoever you are yeah yeah i have a good friend and uh, she's a type a like i am and she gets up like, she's always like, oh, guess what time I got up today? You know, it's kind of like, we get these conversations. And I'm like, 5.30. Yeah, 5.15. And I'm like, oh, that's great. And then like, and if I decide to, I'll say, you know, I got up at 7.30 if it's a weekday. Or I'll say I got up at nine if it's a weekend. Oh my God, half the day would be shot. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm awake the same amount of hours as you are. Don't <laughs> we forecast your paradigm on me. Like, hey, you're a morning person. Jolie and I aren't. We never really been. It's okay. Like, it's all good. Like, you know, and it's like, and she has this productive, you know, the early, hey, the early bird gets the worm. Don't you all know? Like, I guess. I mean, so no, but these, we look at these top, and it's true. There's a philosophy of, of folks that are very, very massively productive who get up early. I mean, it's been proven. There's actually a book about that called Time. Yeah. And, but and how yeah, you know, how people are wired differently. I haven't the, I, I bought it for a while and I was tired. So I said, piss on this. I'll sleep seven, eight hours a night the way I want to. <laughs> you know? This it's just not you, my paradigm. Who do you think you are? <laughs> I don't know. It, I, I, it hasn't hurt me. Right? It hasn't hurt me. Has it helped you? Uh yeah, I feel great. I live in the way, I think any time, and it's a point, it's like, can we live the life that we want, right? The way we want to, life by design, like, it doesn't have, it can be whatever way we want it to, it's like, well, you can't work a job that way. Well, well, sure you can. You know, I don't do any coaching calls, and typically until 10 o'clock, right? I just, it, it, it's, it's intentionally done that way on purpose. It, it, that, that, that's, that's it. And this morning at, um, what time was it? It was 7. 45, I started practicing yoga and I practiced till about 8.30, right? It was, it was designed that way. It was on purpose. So um, I, I'd like to just re recover a couple quick things here and then we'll, we'll go to some Q&A. Um, yeah. So one of the things is like life inventory. As you're sitting out there and listening in, what, ask yourself some questions. You know, where, where, where could I be? Where, where do I feel that I'm not aligned with my truth could be an interesting question. Um, what, how, what if life up to this point has presented me for where I want to, you know, where I want to go forward? What's my next chapter? Um, where, you know, one of the other question you could ask yourself is what am I tolerating? Is there anything in my life that I'm tolerating that maybe I shouldn't be tolerating? No, should I hate that word should, so I stop it. Is there anything in my life that I'm tolerating that I don't feel like I want to anymore? Might be a different question. Is there anywhere that I'm not aligned with my values in my life? And why? Why am I doing that? Um, you know, wh where is my, my where is my thinking potentially limited about myself? 
Or is my thinking potentially limited about what's possible, which is the other limiting belief that we often, often have. And the other thing that you gotta ask yourself too is, where am I not potentially caring as much as I could for myself? And that's one, I'm a real, I'm a high level, I'm a, um, my daughter's five calls me a fancy pants. Um, <laughs> but I am, I, I am a self-care uh, junkie to a degree. And right now I can't get my massages, I can't get my acupuncture, I can't get my go to my chiropractor, I'm choosing not to do these things. And um, it, 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 these are things that help keep me whole. And I just don't, I know you're an ac you do acupuncture too, Tom. Mm -hmm. And the, the bottom line is, is that it is what it is. And there's, and there's, but there's things that, and I'm parent, we're parenting seven days, 24, hour, 24 hours. There's no, there's really no help um, in running businesses. And, and I am, I am working more than I like to or used to. And just because I'm, I'm on, on, on a lot, I don't get to, to, to unplug. Um, but I've chosen that and I've realized that in the last couple of days, like, you know what? Eh, I can accept responsibility for some of this and there's things I can do and initiate going forward, mindset wise and strategic wise. So I, I kind of caught myself on that. Um, but I, I, I think that it's important as you sit out there, you know, what are you, where are you on long, long lines of self care? Cause it's really important. And if you look at this disease that we're experiencing, it's impacting people that have health dispositions more than anyone else. The ones that are really getting sick, typically most of them, this has been studied, most of them have, have had, you know, have some level of challenge. It could be around uh, heart disease, it could be diabetes, it could be diabetic, it could be um, any, of the, any of the myriad of these things. And most of them, 85% of them are lifestyle driven. So I would just, you know, challenge folks to sit out there, listen and like, hey, you know, is there anything I can do to optimize my health and wellness going forward for situations like this? Just for that alone, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good time to, to, to check in on, on that because a lot of that stuff we can, we can have control of. And if, you want, if, you're, if you're into that philosophy, uh, I, will, I would highly recommend Dr. Mark Hyman, H-Y-M-A-N. Um, really great podcast too. Um, really good, good educator on, on that particular topic on health and wellness. Um, anything else, Tom, you want to want to pose as a, a wrap up before we go to Q and A here? No, I, I maybe it's just a question along the lines of the healthcare, um, health care, self care. What you're saying is, I don't know if there's a lot of information. People like you know, it's all the stuff in the news, and a lot of it's you know, gloom and doom, but. Um, suggestions you know it's like well wash your hands do things like that how about what are you doing to strengthen and boost your immune system yep absolutely that's essential that's right yep absolutely and stress management is up as a high one for that and so is sleep and nutrition so um absolutely absolutely and that's well, yeah, I, I'd, love, I'd love to open it up and uh, yeah, okay. That's my, my favorite thing is answering questions. All right, so I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording and thanks everyone for listening. For more information, please visit chrisyonker.com and optimalvisioncoaching.com.